Well, good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Good to see you all. Let's open with some prayer. Good and gracious God, we come today bringing our hearts open to you that what is broken may be healed and that it may be filled with your hope. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to please stand and join me in a brief order of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God full of compassion and mercy, abounding in steadfast love. Trust in God's promise of forgiveness. Let us confess our sin against God and one another. Take a moment of brief silence. Eternal God, our Creator, in you we live and move and have our being. Look upon us, your children, with work of your hands. Forgive us all our offenses and cleanse us from proud thoughts and empty desires. By your grace, draw us near to you, our refuge and our strength, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, given to us. In the mercy of Almighty God, Christ died for us while we were yet still sinners. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Take this time to share the peace.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Lord be with you. God of all peoples, your arms reach out to embrace all those who call upon you. Teach us as disciples of your Son to love the world with compassion and constancy, that your name may be known throughout the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Yeah. 
The first lesson is from Isaiah 56. Thus saith the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right, for soon my salvation will come and my deliverance be revealed. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it, and hold fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel. I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. The word of the Lord. Paul writes, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am, am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience so that he may be merciful to all. The word of the Lord. The Gospel according to Matthew, the 15th chapter. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David, my daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. 
and her daughter was healed instantly. The Gospel of the Lord. May be seated. I invite the children to come forward. Come on up if you want. Yeah. All right. Have you guys ever heard of the word unexpected? Yeah? Kind of have an idea what that might mean? Unexpected is when something is a surprise. Like an example might be, let's say I came, I drove to church this morning, and I left the keys in the car. That would be unexpected, right? Luckily, I didn't do that. Or you're planning to do something really fun out in, on a sunny day, and it starts raining. That would be unexpected. So it kind of surprises you. Well, this morning in the lesson about Jesus, he does something unexpected. So the story begins with a woman asking for Jesus to heal his daughter, and he does her daughter, and he doesn't say yes, and he doesn't say no, and that's kind of unexpected. Usually he gives some sort of answer. In fact, he just ignores her. But then she keeps requesting, and he does something unexpected. He changes his mind, and he does help her. And that is a pretty cool, unexpected thing. You know why I appreciate this story? Because the woman doesn't give up. Sometimes when we pray to God for something and we don't receive what we pray for, or instead we receive a lot of things that are unexpected and it doesn't sound like God's listening to us at all, this story reminds us that God is listening, and that we can just keep praying, keep on. And God is, a, is going to help us, maybe in unexpected ways, but we will be helped. Um, just like that woman kept asking, and she got her prayers answered in an unexpected way. And so that's our good news today, and I'm going to ask you to pray with me, and you can just repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for Jesus, who reminds us that not all prayers, all prayers are ex- answered in expected ways. Amen. Have a seat. I'm going to begin my message today with a story. It's by Ernst Kossman from Jesus Means Freedom. He writes about a church in Holland. So think Holland, okay? And it was a year when the tides were rising and the dikes were collapsing. And there was one really bad weekend that caused the mayor of the town to ask the local Reformed Church pastor if he would bring all of his people on Sunday morning uh, out to repair the dikes, or else they would lose the entire town. So the pastor called the church elders, and they came together and they discussed the matter And they concluded that they had been commanded to keep the Sabbath holy, so if they perished, that was God's will, but they would not cancel services. So the pastor then mentioned 
uh, Jesus' violation of the Sabbath law and hoping it would somehow stimulate some further thought. To which one old elder says, Pastor, I have never before ventured to say this publicly, but I've always thought our Lord Jesus was a bit of a liberal. The opportunity to liberally challenge social boundaries comes up in our story about the Gentile woman who approaches Jesus in desperate determination. Matthew says that the woman approaches Jesus squawking, squawking and screaming like a raven's cry. So imagine that. She's squawking, Lord have mercy, Lord, son of David, my daughter is badly demonized. And the disciples, they send her away, echoing what they had just recently said to the 5,000 plus who followed Jesus into the wilderness. And all in all, this scene, it feels really chaotic and anxious and tense. You've got the woman squawking and following Jesus and his disciples, the disciples frustrated, impatient, and Jesus ignoring the whole thing does not send her away, nor is he compelled to help her. Jesus understands his mission to be to the house of Israel, not a Canaanite woman. She's not like him. She's not of his people. She doesn't fit the mission. Furthermore, there were strict social boundaries about the interrelationship between and communication between men and women, and especially between Jews and Gentiles at the time. Yet this woman will not take no for an answer, will not be ignored. And so she is confident in her faith that Jesus can heal her daughter. She's so confident that she knows that even crumbs of healing would do the job. Now, Jesus' relationships with those who are outside the house of Israel is very complex in the book of Matthew. See, Matthew wrote this gospel for an audience of Jewish Christians for the house of Israel. And in this gospel, there is this complexity. It begins in Matthew 2 when we hear the story of the secular scientists from the east called the Magi who were not of the house of Israel yet following a prophecy and come to worship a newborn baby. And then there's the story in chapter 8 of the Roman centurion whom Jesus admires and is impressed by his remarkable faith. But then you have chapter 10 where Jesus sends out his 12 disciples saying, go nowhere among the Gentiles. Enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. And so now you have Jesus calling this woman, obviously in need of help, a little dog and rejects her. This is a passage that troubles a lot of Christians, perplexes them because it does not shine a positive or flattering light upon Jesus. Many commentators like to de-emphasize the uh, harshness of this story by saying, oh, well, Jesus called them dogs, but little dogs, puppies. So it's not so bad. But at the time... 
dogs, puppies even, weren't understood in the way that we think about them. They weren't practically family members. They weren't these lovable pets, but more utilitarian, maybe pests, um, but certainly not uh, a lovable compliment to give someone, even puppy. And so calling this woman a dog, it shocks us today. But what would have shocked the audience first hearing this, those Jewish Christians, was that Jesus healed a Gentile girl. For it would have been common at that time to consider Gentiles more like dogs than humans. When Jesus listens to this woman, concedes to her clever argument, Jesus is reframing an entire social self-concept in that one moment, changing the entire history of Christianity in the one little story. A foreign woman teaches the Son of God about mercy. Jesus' limited view of his mission is challenged, and Jesus changes his mind. Jesus Christ is not the Savior limited to those who are like him. To the majority of Matthew's listening audience, but rather Jesus Christ is Savior to all. And that's really amazing good news, but maybe you're still troubled about the fact that Jesus called this woman and her daughter little dogs. Canaria is diminutive of Kion, dog. And I heard something interesting in the history of this original Greek word and the history of Greece. See, it was a common insult at the time to call someone a dog. It was a really bad thing to say. But I learned something from the Women's Bible Commentary. In the 4th century BCE, a philosophical movement occurred in Greece that was very critical of social and cultural conventions and political institutions. The followers of this movement were aggressive, they were outspoken, they were sometimes rude, and sometimes they would even bark or pee on, door, on table legs to get attention and to be heard. And this caused them to be called dogs, kind, kindness, which they adopted as the name of their movement, which today is translated cynic. Cynics, the philosophical movement of cynics. In the pursuit of virtue, cynics are quick to point out flaws in others. And the essence of a cynic, especially the philosophical cynic, is to challenge convention. So Jesus is challenged about what is customary for boundaries at that time. What, because it stood in the way of helping those who are in need of help. And he is challenged by, maybe not a little dog, but a little cynic. In light of that, this definition of cynic, you might consider the text from Romans a little cynical. The most important sentence in Romans 11 is found in verse 1, part A. Has God rejected his people? By no means! Exclamation point. Christ is Savior to all. Christ is Savior to all. And such news is scandalous and disturbing for some. 
because that means Christ is Savior to those who don't do things the way we do things. Don't look like us. Don't act like us. Don't believe like us. But Christ is Savior to all. See, God's love and grace is given to all, and that goes against, it, it feeds into our ideas that if I don't get something out of this that is special just to me, then why should I even bother? What's the point? I want a reward. I want to be special. I want to be greater than someone else. All coming from this core belief that in order for me to win, somebody has to lose. You know, we get no special treatment. God, grace, is inclusive. We win, and so does the next person. There is so many issues in our world that divide us today coming from this idea of us versus them. If I win, you must lose. This past week, our nation became engaged in debate and outrage and humility about events that occurred in Charlottesville last Saturday, but this is an age-old conversation. It's an old conversation and debate because at the core, we are soul-sick people. When events that confront us like racism or classism or injustice or violence come up, they remind us of our brokenness as people. There were brokenness inside of us, all of us. I found some spiritual relief, believe it or not, in Luther's small catechism this week. As I was thinking about all of this, and probably because I was thinking about confirmation starting soon. In the back of your ELWs, these red hymnals here, you will find the small catechism. So if you do not have a small catechism, you can find it in this bullet, this uh, hymnal, 1162 at the very end is the part that I looked at, what the small catechism says about the creed, the third article on being made holy. It reads, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Luther then asks, what is this? And he used that question because it was something that his little son would ask all the time when he encountered something new. He'd say, was ist los, Papa? And the small catechism was written for parents. The small catechism is written for parents to teach and pass on the faith to their children. And so he figured, that's a pretty good question to put in a text for parents to teach faith to their children. What is this? And what it is, is this. I believe that my, my own understanding or strength, I cannot believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But instead, the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, made me holy, and kept me in true faith. Just as he calls, gathers, enlightens, and makes holy the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one common faith, true faith, Daily in this Christian church, the Holy Spirit abundantly forgives all sins, mine and those of all believers. And on the last day, the Holy Spirit will raise me and all the dead and will give to me and all believers in Christ eternal life. This is most certainly true. 
No matter how hard we try, we all have brokenness, and we cannot, by our own strength and understanding, get past that. But the Holy Spirit can and does. So we have a Savior who is Savior to all people and a Spirit that calls, gathers, enlightens, and makes us holy and abundantly forgives and grants us opportunities, here's key, to take a painful look into our hearts and release the brokenness that lives there in full knowledge that we may be healed and by being healed we may heal others. We cannot by our own strength and understanding get past our brokenness. But by the Spirit coming upon us and making us holy, we examine that brokenness. We release it. We are strengthened and healed. There is a blessing in the little cynics in our lives. They have an ability to point out faults in social rules and mores that prevent universal help hope, and healing. Little cynics help us to take ownership of our brokenness. So I have a blessing to close this message. May we all be open to receive the Spirit and be made holy. May we examine our hearts and minds and release the brokenness within May we lament for our church body and for our lives when it comes to matters of injustice. May we give thanks that we continue to open our eyes and see all our relatives. May we remember that we are called to participate in life for all, not simply to participate in life for the sake of ourselves. May we bear with one another forgive each other, clothe ourselves with love which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Amen.
Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty. Generous, compassionate God, we gather before you to pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Unite us, O God, so that all who worship receive assurance and nourishment by faith. Rescue those who suffer from religious persecution. Lord, in your mercy. Teach us, O God, so that the holy mountains and peaceful valleys of your good creation may be restored to the health you intend. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Empower us, O God, to advocate for those on the margins. Open the hearts of leaders in every nation to serve those who are most vulnerable. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Equip us, O God, with your love for our brothers and sisters. Heal the sick, comfort the grieving, feed the hungry, and calm those in, in distress. We especially pray for June Dunka, Officer Gary, and we pray for the families and people get warning uh, the passing of Officer Gary Michael, Jr. Lord, in your mercy. Rouse us, O oh God, to praise you with gladness. We give thanks for musicians, worship leaders, intercessors, those who prepared the communion table, and all who make our worship express your, our joy. Lord, in your mercy. We give you thanks, O oh God, for all of the saints who have deepened our lives of prayer. Gather us with them in endless praise of you. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands we praise all our prayers, spoken and unspoken, trusting in the mercy of Jesus Christ.
Merciful God, you open wide Merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love, you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to all to eat, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it to all to drink, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Whenever we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we do so remembering Christ died, Christ risen, and Christ shall come again. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food. The body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all glory and honor, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Oh, we do have a prayer. <laughs> Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. All are welcome to receive this meal of forgiveness you may come forward when the ushers uh, let you know. You may stand or kneel along the railings. You'll receive the bread and then the choice of dark liquid, which is wine, or light liquid, which is grape juice, and there are gluten-free elements available. If you need someone to come bring the communion to you, just let the ushers know. Come, let us eat.
invite you to please stand as you are able and receive the blessing, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Jesus Christ, host of this meal, you have given us not only this bread and cup, but your very self, that we may feast on your great love. Filled again by these signs of your grace, may we hunger for your reign of justice. May we thirst for your way of peace. For you are Lord forevermore. Amen. You may be seated. Announcements for the week are found in the messenger. I uh, suggest taking a look at that. Um, take it home if you need to. Uh, today, between services, there is a Reformation trip information session. And also tomorrow, uh, if you are interested in participating in Grief Share, which is a grief support group, it will officially be starting tomorrow at 6 o'clock. And uh, that is a 13-week course, so please come. And I we have one more. I'd like to ask Danny and Lauren to come forward. They are going to be leaving our congregation because they are daring to move back closer to their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Um, we're going to miss them very much, but we are going to have a, a service of farewell and Godspeed for them at this time. Lauren and Danny, and you can turn around and face them. <laughs> I got a tissue beforehand. <laughs> Lauren and Danny Thompson are leaving our congregation, and we wish to bid them farewell. In holy baptism, our Lord Jesus Christ received you and made you members of his church. When you came to this congregation, we rejoiced to receive you into our fellowship in the gospel. In this community of faith, you have heard the proclamation of God's word, which reveals his loving purpose for you and for all creation. You have been nourished at Christ's holy table and called to be witness of the gospel. God has blessed you in this fellowship, and he has blessed us through you. We encourage you to continue to receive and share God's gifts in your new creation as workers with us in the kingdom of God. And... Um, as I was serving them communion this morning, it occurred to me, this is the last time I will be serving them communion here. But I remember something that Pastor Herm Frerich said. When we kneel at the communion table, we are kneeling with all of the saints that have gone before, all of the saints that will follow, and all of the saints wherever they are in this world. So let us remember, when we kneel at this communion rail, we are still communing with you. Would you all like to say anything? Thank you. Thank you. Not easy, but we're going to do it. All right. No, no, no. We've got to pray. We've got to pray. We've got a little prayer. We're not done yet. Okay. Let us pray. <laughs> we're going to make you suffer a little bit more up here. Okay. <laughs> All right, eternal God, we thank you for Lauren and Danny and for our life together in this congregation and community. As they have been a blessing to us, so now we send them forth to be a blessing to others through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for traveling with us last 27 years. It has been our joy. 
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Please stand and receive a benediction. May the power of God strengthen you. May the love of Jesus Christ heal you. And may the wisdom of the Holy Spirit guide you now and forever. Amen. Welcome all to work.